Okay, hello everybody. Um, we are recording now. Uh, this is the bi-weekly meeting of the UMBC Cyber Defense Lab. And today it's our honor to have uh, Dr. Edward Ziegler speak on some of his recent uh, analysis of an old uh, protocol that was developed at MIT by uh, Leighton and McCauley as part of the Clipper Chip project. Um, we will be posting this uh, video on the uh, CDL and UMBC Cybersecurity Center websites. Uh, looking ahead, uh, we have two more scheduled talks for the CDL meeting. Uh, the next one will be by Ian Blumenfeld on formal methods, and uh, the last one will be on a, a usability expert, um, Inka Blankert from Paris. So thank you very much, Ed. We look forward to your talk. All right, so we'll see if uh, this all works sharing wise. Okay, are you seeing my slides? I can see it. Okay. <laughs> I've, I've got a strange setup, so it's it's uh, I've lost uh, lost my view of everybody else. Well, actually, I didn't lose it, but it's uh, up in the corner of a different screen. So, um, so what I'm going to talk today about is how we're using the cryptographic protocol shapes analyzer to design new quantum resistant protocols. So, uh, if you attended past CDL talks, you may have heard about CPSA. If not, uh, cryptographic protocol shapes analyzer is a software tool that we've designed to assist in the design and analysis of cryptographic protocols. So when we talk about cryptographic protocols, uh, we mean that these protocols that use cryptography and specific patterns of interactions between principles in order to meet certain security goals, such as authentication uh, or key exchange and such. Uh, so what the tool does is it takes input uh, of a protocol definition and a partial description of an execution in and each is built within a particular formal model by the user and then it attempts to describe produce descriptions of all possible executions of that protocol that will complete the partial description that we've provided and from this we can read off what security properties or attacks may exist against a, pro a protocol and so we're using CPSA to help us design secure quantum resistant protocols. So is this moving? No. All right. <laughs> so why are the motivation for these protocols uh, with uh, quantum computers and you know when we had Shor's algorithm, which uh, has been around since 94, I think it's when he, when it was published. And the advances in quantum computing were many of the protocols that we use for key exchange on the internet are at risk for being uh, compromised. And when those are compromised, although much of the information is transferred across the internet using symmetric algorithms, the keys that are used are generated through or transmitted through public key cryptography. So if we end up with the situation where uh, the quantum algorithms are no longer secure, we're gonna need to replace them because otherwise all the information would be available to anyone who collected it or had actually uh, all they have to do is collect the public key exchange to retrieve the symmetric key that is used to collect, collect to send most of the data. So we're worried about that and we want to produce new quantum resistant algorithms that, to replace these. So the way most of these have been reviewed is that there's a lot of work. NIST currently has a competition for a replacement quantum resistant algorithms that are using new types of math, uh, things that are, involve uh, 
Merple trees and other things that are out. Uh, and I don't remember all of the. Possible ways that they're doing this, but a lot of lattice based. Uh, approaches for design for creating new public key. Algorithms that would be resistant to quantum computers. Uh, we took a different tact because symmetric algorithms and, and the uh, code books that we use today aren't vulnerable to the to analysis with a quantum computer. It's still the same problem of you have to try all the keys uh, if you're looking for for a particular one. So it's not some special math that suddenly we can we have a way a new way to uh, determine how those keys are sent. So what we've got gone and done is take a look at old protocols that uh, did this. So what I'm going to talk a little bit about is protocol one with conventional encryption. And this is taken from the Needham Schroeder paper, which uh, if you've looked at uh, any of the protocol analysis tools, they always talk about the Needham Schroeder. And in that paper, it's protocol two, which is the public key authentication. Anyone building a protocol analysis tool uses that to prove that, yes, their tool actually can find attacks because the, these protocols have been around for a while and protocol, uh, the public key, Needham Shorter public key protocol has actually been attacked first with a formal tool that was fairly effective against it uh, by Gavin Lowe. And so that paper actually has a couple of protocols, the two protocols particularly. One of them doesn't use public key. And that is the the one with conventional encryption. And it actually is the basis for another well well used, well known protocol. And you'll see it in a in a second. The other thing is another protocol that was built off of the idea of Needham Schroeder is this Leighton Macaulay protocol. And they were working on a key agreement scheme for the clipper key, clipper chip. And then so that algorithm is what we're going to use as a basis for building our uh, quantum resistant uh, algorithms. But before we get started, let's take a look at Needham Schroeder. So if you, you see this, Needham Schroeder consists of three parties. So we have an authentication server, which is a trusted entity, and we have our two parties. Uh, Alice and Bob that want to communicate with each other. So, if you look carefully at the messages in this protocol, you'll recognize these. Uh, these messages are very similar. In fact, uh, this protocol was used as the basis for Kerberos. So, Kerberos version four, the first message is identical to the first message that is sent. The only difference being that in this case we send uh, nonce which is represented as IA, and in Kerberos, you send a timestamp. And then you get back the second message, which is very similar. You get a ticket uh, in Kerberos, and this you get a key encrypted uh, trap, uh, what we refer to as the conversation key in this protocol. But it's it's a, essentially the same message without some of the uh, things and the use of time instead of uh, nonces. Now, the nonces are there so that Alice knows this is a fresh key that was generated by the authentication server. And then you can see Alice then just transmits the uh, key over to, to Bob. And then the authentication is that Bob will prove he has access to the key by encrypting a nonce with that key. And Alice will then decrypt it and send it back. One less and those last two message again are the same messages that are used in Kerberos to authenticate. Essentially, you send back, send a nonce encrypted with the key to prove you have the key and then you get the nonce back encrypted under the nonce minus one encrypted under the key comes back. So we do a slight transformation so that uh, you can't just simply replay the message. So we've modeled this in CPSA and. So this is the a simple model. We've got a server role, which is going to just be our definition of how the server works. And it just simply receives that message and then sends the message back with the with a fresh. They, if you notice, we have unique generation. 
your unique origination rather in this case uh, of uh, CK that's in the role because this is a trusted server. Our server is intended to always generate a fresh key every time it runs. So we don't want to consider cases where uh, the server is broken because under those conditions, the, the whole protocol will fall apart anyway. Um, so we receive our message, we send our response, which is uh, encrypted under a long-term secret that uh, Alice has with the server. And inside of that is another uh, message with the, the key, the freshly produced key that's encrypted under a long-term key that the server shares with Bob, and it also includes Alice's name so that Bob knows who this key is for. And then essentially the initiator is just going to, to make the requests and then send over the, the key that, the, the message that he got. And you'll notice that we say that uh, in, if you look at the role for the initiator, I haven't specified exactly the same message that was sent from the server in what was received. Instead, I have taken the uh, ticket, if you were using uh, uh, Kerberos terms, which is the uh, traffic key and Alice's name encrypted under Bob's key, and just received that as a message type. And the reason I do this is because the initiator really shouldn't be able to know what's in that message. And so I want CPSA to consider the fact that it would have no way of knowing that. Uh, if I had received it as it was sent, then CPSA would determine that there is more information to, to be able to know that it is of the correct form and the correct information is inside because it generally uses authenticated, our model uses authenticated encryption. So if, you're, if you over specify some things, then it is possible for CPSA to determine things that it probably shouldn't. Uh, and the, finally, this represents the responder role and then our partial execution, which is the defined skeleton, where we define a skeleton of NS1, which is what I've named the protocol. And in this case, you can see from the picture that the initiator talks to the server and the initiator talks to the responder. And in this case, this is the only shape we get. So it indicates that if the initiator is communicating, if the server is generating a fresh key, and if the keys between the initiator and the server and the responder and the server are all uncompromised, then we're going to get only executions that we would expect where the initiator can communicate correctly with the and authenticate the responder. When we look at it from the responder's point of view, we'll get two different shapes. The shape that is listed as 10 is what we would expect to see, which is that the initiator had made a request to the server and got a key and then authentication took place. And the initiator is able, the responder is able to authenticate the initiator and everything is fine. The additional shape 13, that occurs because we haven't said that the initiator takes, generates a fresh value. So that nonce IA, if it's not fresh, then it is possible that you could have two start runs of the initiator start. Both of them generate the same message and send it off to the server, but only one of them will be able to complete because it only one of them is going to, uh, to have, to be communicating with the responder. So, it's not an attack, but it is just another thing that CPSA will do in the analysis. Since I don't know that the, uh, the nonce that the initiator generated is fresh, then I can get shapes where if I'm not picking a fresh nonce, it is possible that I may have two runs where I chose the same value, security value. Finally, we take a look at uh, Needham Schroeder and just verify that one, you can't hear the uh, traffic key. 
our uh, communication key, CK. If you can hear that, then obviously this protocol would be broken. You would be able to, to read this. So based on the protocol, we can't, CPSA cannot satisfy a skeleton where there exists a responder and the key is leaked. And we further checked since the server generates a responder, we also check to see whether or not if in the presence of a server and a responder, we could hear the key and in neither case we can. So that's the analysis of Needham Schroeder. And the reason for taking a look at this is because Leighton and Macaulay based their protocol on this. And so I wanted to, to just quickly run through that and show you what these shapes were. So. All right, so Leighton and Macaulay developed this uh, algorithm to do key exchange for the Clipper chip. So Clipper chip, for those of you who haven't been around, uh, was introduced in about 92, 93 as a, an approach to, it was a hardware designed chip to, that would be placed inside of telephones, faxes, and other th and other sort of communication devices that we would use on the telephone network at the time to protect information that is passed across the telephones so that all of our communication in the US would have been, uh, the idea would have, that eventually all of the communication in the US would have been protected by clipper chips. And so this hardware chip would encrypt all the information. And so if anyone was eavesdropping, they wouldn't be able to receive that. Uh, the problem with that is that uh, there are people in the government that like to eavesdrop on U.S. Com commercial things, and that would be the FBI. So as part of the scheme, there was this idea that we would have this key escrow approach, and the Clipper chip actually had what they referred to as the LEAF, which was a, a law enforcement access uh, feature, is what LEAF stood for. And essentially, that was the key to whatever the communication was that was being sent. It was encrypted inside this, this uh, leaf, and that was part of all communications that took place. So if you were the FBI and wiretapping, you would have the information and then the key would be in the leaf. But the idea was that there would be a split of the key so that it required, you couldn't get the key to do, to decrypt the leaf unless you got both pieces of the key which was that was used to create the the actual key that was used for it for uh encrypting that leaf and those were meant to be held by different government agencies the point of doing that was so that this was the key escrow you could get access to that communication but you'd have to talk to two different agencies uh lots of controversy over all of this um in and also eventually uh, there were some attacks that were discovered against some of the system, but a lot of controversy over this whole key escrow uh, idea, you know, who was going to be trusted to hold the keys. Um, there were even infighting among government uh, agencies about who should be holding the keys. Uh, so so uh, it was, it was not a, a good system. Leighton McCauley uh, actually had received a grant to develop a key distribution scheme for this. Because if you're, if you have a set of telephones and they all have these encryption kits, what you want to do is generate a fresh key for each of these. Each time you have to make a phone call, a fresh key needs to be generated for that session. So they were building uh, a key management system for this. So there are key management protocols. Uh, is what we're going to use to take a look at this. Now they approached this as, and it was intended to in, address some drawbacks in current approaches. So one of the drawbacks was public key cryptography in their view. And as it turns out, Peter Shore, who cr the creator of Shore's algorithm was uh, Tom Layton's uh, PhD student. So the fact that uh, that uh, he was getting ready to publish his uh, uh, algorithm may have led uh, 
Leighton and McCauley to, to believe that, yeah, these things are not necessarily safe, this public key approach where we're relying on these math problems that maybe somebody has a better way to, to solve than what we currently know. So that was one aspect. So they wanted to design an algorithm that didn't have, wasn't susceptible to, say, a quantum computer. Um, and the other was that they wanted to address some of the drawbacks in the trusted agent scheme, like Kerberos and Knight Needham Schroeder, which is also why I showed you what Needham Schroeder was, because they wanted to address those drawbacks in that scheme. And some of the drawbacks that they were trying to address, if you looked at Needham Schroeder, you noticed that in order to ever communicate, you always have to talk to the trusted agent. So they wanted to come up with a way not to do that. So here is their algorithm and their approach. They have a trusted agent chooses two master secret keys. <clears throat> so one key master secret is for exchange keys. And the other master secret is for authentication keys. One of the drawbacks that they saw in Needham Schroeder was that there wasn't any authentication of the keys uh, in their view. The reality was that uh, for Needham Schroeder, there was a, if it was encrypted under the key that was the, the shared secrets between the uh, trusted agent and the party that was receiving it, then that was their authentication that the the key was produced by the trusted agent. But they wanted to have some way to, to verify that uh, no one had modified keys in this case. So they also added authentication keys. And then what the trusted agent does is he computes individual keys for each user that is based on those master keys that were produced. So each individual user gets a key, which is a hash of the key, the, the exchange key master and the identity of the user. Since the identities are all unique, then the, each key will be unique. And they do the same for an authentication key, which they, they list as K prime, which is just a hash of uh, the master authentication key with the identity. So every user has a key that is based on these master keys and their identity. <clears throat> so to communicate with any individual, if, if uh, a user, user I wishes to communicate with user J, what they're gonna do is they're gonna obtain from the trusted agent or from their own store, a pair key. So this is uh, a key that is generated by the trusted agent it is essentially the hash of your individual key, your your uh, exchange key, and the identity of the party you wish to talk to. So each party has each pair has this key such that uh, so if if I wants to talk to Jay, he's going to ask the, the trusted agent for a pairwise key. That pair key is going to be hash of the key exchange key of Jay with I's identity. And we're going to XOR that with the hash of key exchange, the I's key exchange with Jay's identity. And this pair key then can be extracted by I if he wants to talk to J because he has K sub I, that is his secret, and he just has to hash in J's identity with it and then XOR it with, with the pair key. And then he'll obtain hash of KJ with I, which is the key that he can use to exchange information with, with J. And the advantage to this is that J doesn't have to know PIJ, the pair key. He just has to know who sent him the message. And then he just takes his secret and hashes it with the identity of who sent him the message. 
to verify this, there's an authenticator. And that authenticator is simply a hash of of uh, the, your own. Uh, and so if it's I wants to communicate, he's going to get an authenticator that is a hash of his authentication key with the key encryption key that you use to communicate with uh, with J. And that, of course, is just a hash of J's private key with I's identity. So we hashed it all together. All right, so <clears throat> when we want to make a communicate, when we're ready to communicate, so I've already explained this, and so I'll just quickly look at this. We're going to generate a uh, key V, which is our key encryption key. And we, we do that by taking our private key, hashing it with the person we wish to talk to, J, and XORing that with the pair key from I to J, if I and J are communicating. And that produces V. Then user I can verify key encryption key V just by hashing V with uh, his own authentication key and then comparing it with the authenticator. If they match, then he knows that he has the right key. And then all he simply does is pick a session key and encrypt it with V, send it along with his identity to uh, J, and then they can, I and J can now communicate. For Jay, all he does is he takes uh, his his secret, hash it with uh, I's identity to obtain V so that he can decrypt uh, and uh, retrieve S. And that's as, as simply as the, as the mechanisms work. So what are the improvements that over Needham Schroeder? Well, the first improvement is that the trusted authority doesn't need to be continuously available. All right, so if I am going to send uh, a message, I just need to have that pair key. And the pair key, it doesn't have to be protected because it's the XOR of two other secrets. So there isn't anything in it that requires that it be protected. So it's sort of a public component. You can leave it, to, uh, you could, you. You can essentially store it on your system, and it's uh, if you so you only have to talk to a trusted agent once to obtain the pair key. Another thing that they were concerned with is with Needham Schroeder, and the same problem occurs with Kerberos version four. I can get uh, a lot of plain text ciphertext pairs, right? So I just send in a message a request. And then I get back an encryption with information that included under that encryption that I know what it is. Uh, with Kerberos, this has led to many dictionary, offline dictionary attacks because I can request usernames and then get back information. I know what much of the information is in the message. And since these are encrypted under passwords as keys, uh, we can launch dictionary attacks against those. So they wanted to eliminate that possibility, and that isn't something that you receive from a trusted authority. It doesn't provide anything. It provides this pair key, uh, which is two, two keys XOR together. So there isn't any information that you can use in, in terms of pairwise, uh, pair, plain text, ciphertext pairs to do any type of uh, attack in that way. Their other claim was that it doesn't require an additional protocol to authenticate. So they, the view was that if I send you this key encrypted under this, under your key encryption key, you'll be able to authenticate me because if, if the identity isn't correct, I'm not going to be able to decrypt the message to get the secret out. Um, and so. You'll know, and if I'm able to get the secret, then I know who you are and you know who I am. And that was their their assumption in this. Whereas if you look at Kerberos and with uh, Needham Schroeder, there's an additional two steps where I actually authenticate the other party. 
So I send information, encrypt it under the key, and receive information back. Their belief was that they didn't need to do that, and so they could just send it. I wanted to bring up one interesting quote that I saw from this paper that uh, that will become more interesting when we look at the analysis. And so in this scheme above, in order to provide uh, a fair comparison between our approach and the Needham-Schroeder, we have addressed with better results, after all technical advances should occur after 15 years, essentially the same security concerns as in the, as in the summarized Needham Schroeder scenario. So that was from their paper uh, in that they they felt that they did a better job of addressing the issues in Needham Schroeder. And in some instances they had. But as you'll see, they didn't take advantage of all technical advances that occurred over 15 years. So this is the model of uh, the late Macaulay protocol. So in this case, they use XOR. CPSA has no way to represent XOR uh, natively in the, the analysis. XOR is one of those uh, difficult to model uh, properties. Most of these tools, uh, Tamarin, uh, Bot MPA, uh, CPSA, um, they use a rewriting approaches in order to, to reason about uh, the uh, protocols. And one of the problems with XOR is that it's hard to find a confluent rewriting rule. So we can't get to, it to a point where we can have a normal form that doesn't change. You can always swap it back and forth. And so it's very difficult to, to natively put that into CPSA. But for our purposes, I can represent XOR as essentially a lottery protocol because what I'm looking for is if I get one value, then I get all, so I win them all. So I've got a lottery protocol essentially here for XOR. So what I do is if I'm gonna XOR two messages together, say X and Y, what I'm gonna send is the encryption of X under Y and the encryption of Y under X. So this will allow CPSA to determine if it can find either of those messages, it will be able to extract the other. So this gives it the ability to do that. And so this was just a clever way of uh, allowing CPSA to look for uh, cases where if something did leak, I could obtain more information than would normally be possible in the way that CPSA treats uh, encryption. I also have a few other macros that are just so. So the exchange keys, I have a macro that produces those, and I chose to do something mnemonic in that uh, it's the macro is KE takes a key and then an identity. So I end up with key encryption key uh, of uh, the entity. It's one of uh, the identity is one way of doing this. So I have macros for the the key exchange key and the authentication key. I also have a macro for the uh, pairwise key and for uh, the authenticator, A. And I set those up to make it simpler to, to actually specify the protocol. So there is a trusted agent, an extra, so we have to model three roles within uh, Lake McCall, just as we had to model three for Needham Schroeder. In this case, the trusted agent doesn't have to actually be around all the time. It just has to, to create the master keys and then create the appropriate uh, private keys for each individual and the pairwise keys and authenticators. Other than that, uh, it doesn't have to be around once it produces these things. Uh, so there are different ways I could have modeled this, but the simplest way was just to say that there was a role, it would initialize uh, a pair of master keys. So these get stored as state, which means I could model it in a way that I could separate them out. And then I'm gonna send each party its keys. So I send the, the key exchange key and the authentication key, and those are sent under keys that are 
uh, pairwise secure between the trusted agent and the entity that's receiving them. So whoever's receiving their keys, they have a key that is specific just for the transfer of those things. So we we guarantee that the that uh, the communication of those private freshly generated values to the entities that are receiving them are secure. So for our initiator role, we have two messages at the beginning, which are the receptions of the private keys from the trusted agent and reception of the uh, pairwise key and authenticator. Those are all needed for us to be able to run the protocol because everybody has their own keys and they also have their thing. Then, then I run the protocol. So I send uh, my name along with the session key encrypted under the key, the uh, key encryption key that I obtained from the pairwise key. Then I'm going to receive a nonce from the, uh, as I said, with Leighton McCulley, they, they assumed at this point after the, that uh, send that the message would be fine. And that in many instances would be work very much like encrypted email today. I could encrypt a message with S, send that along, and then with my name and the encryption of S, and then you'd be able to read it. But in this case, we're looking at protocols where we would continue to communicate. So in this case, we're doing an exchange just as we would with uh, Needham Schroeder. So I'm going to request that complete authentication so that we can continue to communicate with us. So in this case, I've extended their protocol to include a reception of a, a fresh value from the, the responder and then send back a hash of that value. Also encrypted under a session key to prove that yes, I am actually there to the responder. And then this is just the responder role. The first message again is just to receive his own private information. One other thing I needed to add to this was I didn't want CPSA to consider that there might be other uh, trust agents out there. I trust that the agent will generate the values. I didn't want CPSA to consider that what happens if there are multiple trust agents and they're all generating different values for people. Uh, we're assuming there's only one. So I've defined a rule that, that forces CPSA to consider that if it actually installs another trust agent, those are equal. And so it will eliminate that extra trust agent. So we're restricted to one trust agent in the system. <clears throat> so as uh take a look at an analysis of this. So this is an analysis from the perspective of the initiator of the protocol. So the trusted agent, those messages that are connected to trusted agent could have occurred at any time. The important thing to remember about CPSA is the arrows indicate order, but not when they happened. Uh, the, so you gain some information about things that are fresh, but other than that, you don't know how long messages took to get there. But this is an example from the initiator's perspective, everything works fine. It uh, represents that the initiator was able to generate a session key, which he generated freshly. So he knows that when he gets the responses back from the responder, that the responder actually is able to access the current key and he is able to identify that, yes, he had access to it. From the uh, responder's perspective, though, this is where the protocol has some issues. So what we see here is that the responder receives a message from the initiator. We know that the initiator had to produce the session key and encrypt it at some point. But we don't know from the responder's perspective whether S is a new key 
because I cannot say anything about S. I don't initiate it, so I don't know if it's fresh. If it's not fresh, then it's possible the intruder knows it. If the intruder knows it, the intruder can take a message that the initiator had done, had sent to the responder at some point in the past, and then play that replay that message to a responder and then complete the protocol without the initiator. So that is uh, unfortunately an attack that was brought up against Needham Schroeder in 1981. Denning and Sacco had produced an attack where the against a this sort of this exact replay attack against Needham Schroeder uh, in 1981. Now, the difference here is that when we modeled, uh, when we did the model of Needham Schroeder, you didn't see this type of attack. And you didn't because the key was produced freshly by a trusted agent. So when Needham, when, when Denning and Sacco pr produced their attack, what they said was that someone had to, to actually break a traffic key. And, but if they did, then they would be able to do this replay attack. For Lake Macaulay, this is this attack was available directly because no longer was the trusted agent involved in in a way that we knew that he correctly produced a symmetric key. Instead, we relied on the initiator, and from our analysis, since that's not necessarily a trusted agent, it's possible that this could have been. Uh, we're we're not able to make the same, draw the same conclusions that the key was, the session key was correctly generated in the first place. And so that's why we end up with it showing up immediately. Uh, the paper that Leighton and Macaulay wrote spent most of their time proving that the keys would be safe, but not that the protocol that used them would be safe. And so that they missed this and this is why I uh, highlighted that quote of theirs that, you know, after 15 years, there had been, there were advances, so that things should improve, but uh, they missed one of the advances. Uh, and the reason that there are timestamps in Kerberos and not just nonsense. And so just to show you that uh, the Denning Sacco attack does exist within, uh, within Needham Schroeder, if you compromise the key, Here's uh, an example where I've actually compromised the key. You'll notice the server has a third message. The third message is actually leaking the key. So you can see that uh, it one run is complete, but then someone takes an, a mess. Essentially, the intruder copies the message and then is able to, once he has access to the key, is able to complete with another run of the responder. So that's just an the demonstration that yes, this attack does actually exist and it's here. So what are this, the uh, late Macaulay failure is strictly brought on for the same reason it occurs in Needham Schroeder in that there's a, not a guarantee of freshness. I, if the, if the intruder actually contributed to the key, the session key, this should all go away because the idea is if I've contributed to the key, I know my values I've contributed are fresh. So if you contribute key parts of the key that are not fresh, it's still going to be a fresh key. But I can't know whether you're contributing anything fresh. So I want to put the freshness uh, in my part of the protocol so that when I'm communicating with you, if we're both contributing to this, we can, we can guarantee that the key will be fresh. And so our modification essentially looked to stop that by having each party produce a nonce. And then the nonces are actually distributed under the keys. So we're gonna replace uh, the symmetric key with a nonce. And we're going to respond under the keys to produce an, with another nonce to produce a session key. And we'll just derive the session key from both nonces and the key and and the private uh, key encryption key. So here's a variation in our new protocol. 
So what we've done is, is to uh, send, as I said, we replaced S in our initiator with N0. The second message is a little different. We're not going to encrypt N1 with S. Instead, we're encrypting N1 with a new key. It's not even going to be the key that was previously sent. It could have been, but we decided we would make it a new key. And by how we made it a new key was we just incorporated N0 into the, the previous uh, key encryption key and sent N1 in that form. Since the initiator produced N0, it can also produce the key that uh, N1 is encrypted under since he knows what was sent. And then he finally responds by sending back the hash of N1 so that the responder knows that this value is what the, that he's authenticated that the initiator is actually there. And this is encrypted under the session key, which is a hash of the, uh, of the key encryption key with both nonces, N0 and N1. And that's the key we continue to use as the encryption key. So that's a fresh key every time. It's fresh from my perspective because I guarantee freshness of, of a nonce. And so either party is guaranteeing the freshness of part of the, they can, they can guarantee their own freshness. Uh, so this guarantees that the key is fresh. And that's the approach we've taken with this, but is this correct? We have to make sure that that's the case. So we actually implement that within CPSA and run it. Uh, as we said before, from the initiator's perspective, that nothing has changed uh, other than the protocols change. But in terms of how the analysis runs, I still know that uh, I'm still authenticating the responder just as I did before. But the only reason I could do it before in the late Macaulay was because I knew that the session key was fresh. But in this case, from the responder's view, it is also the case that this only completes with the initiator. I'm able to authenticate the initiator. We both contributed fresh values. The key is new. The intruder has no way to, to uh, leverage our information. In fact, he has not no access to any of the the components of the key that was generated. So he doesn't have access to N0, he doesn't have access to N1, he never had access to uh, my individual secret keys. So that protects it. And we also did a secrecy analysis of this and looked for whether or not you could hear N0 or N1 from the protocol to guarantee that uh, all the components were actually secret in them in the uh, construction of a key. So the benefits that we're claiming for the, the protocol is it does provide mutual authentication as we've actually shown with CPSA. Uh, both parties are gonna contribute to the session key. So this, is, this helps guarantee that uh, you know that there is fresh values in the key. I'm not relying on one other, another party to do this. We both contributed. Uh, the trust in it, Agent doesn't have to be continuously available. That's still the advantage that we had received from Lake Macaulay because, you know, those pair keys can be public. One way you could do this is you could actually publish all pair keys. Um, and that was something, the, the problem with that is there are N squared keys. So depending on how big N is, that's a lot of pairwise keys getting published. But you could publish in smaller networks, you could publish all the keys. And then you just obtain the pairwise key that for the party you wish to communicate with. Uh, the receiver never needs access to the trusted agent in these schemes because that the key is built from the identity of the party that wishes to communicate you with you and your private key. You don't have to talk to the trusted agent. This is sort of works in, in the scheme that they were coming up with when you're talking about telephones, you want to be able to, you may need a directory to get a telephone number, but if you're receiving the telephone call, you don't need to go to the directory to figure out how to receive the call. You just receive the call and you can receive the call from anyone. All I need to know is who's calling. And so if the identity is in the 
the initial message, then I use my secret to create the key that I can use to decrypt it. We don't use any uh, any clever math, so it's quantum resistant, and we verified the properties of this protocol with CPSA. All right, so questions that anyone has, and uh, since I wasn't able to see anything, I'll see if I can. <laughs> I'm going to drop out of this so I can see things. <laughs> but if you have questions, let me know. Have you had any communications with Macaulay and Layton? Do they know about your work? Uh, no, we haven't had any communications with them. Uh, we haven't communicated. Th I think the last time we communicated with them was back in the 90s uh, about this. And we just picked this up again uh, because there we have some. Uh, we have had some. Uh, new things come up and it was sort of like. Well, you know, and in particularly in in some uh, networking systems that we were looking for replacements, and we knew about this work and said, you know, this probably would work for us. In hindsight, the way you present it, it makes it look very um, obvious that there's a potential for this type of vulnerability, just on the basis of who generates values when. I, uh, yeah, this is, it was sort of, uh, when we looked at it, it was, we, we knew that we needed to add key just by looking at it. <laughs> we needed to have both parties contribute to the key in order to eliminate the types of vulnerabilities. I, the, the issues that they bring up, those have been well known. Yeah, I mean, Denning Sacco wrote their paper in 81 when they said that this would be a, an issue. And given that, uh, the only reason it doesn't show up in a CPSA analysis is because you actually have to break the key because the key was produced by a trusted agent. But when you look at the, the late Macaulay, they're saying that the party uses a key. And if I don't trust that the party always is playing by the rules, which is how we mostly consider these kinds of protocols, then obviously we can't trust that S is going the session key S is going to be uh, fresh, and if it's not fresh, well, obviously these are these are bad things to happen. What are your future plans with this line of direction? Um, so we have. I'm actually working on several variations of this. Uh, there are there are different. Uh, this is the basic uh, simplest way to, to correct this. And we've got a couple of different um, variations of this protocol that we would really use. So we're expanding the, the different protocols for a couple of different uh, systems. Actually, I don't think I could talk about the systems, but. <laughs> Does anybody else have a question out there? I'd like to remind everybody that uh, we at UMBC have a protocol analysis lab and we do this type of analysis with the CPSA tool. And if any of you are interested in joining us, uh, please send me an email and we'd be happy to um, show you around and, and help bring you up to speed with the CPSA. Um, in the fall, I'll be teaching an instance of the Ensure Cybersecurity Research course, which is a really cool course offered once every two years at UMBC. Students form small groups to carry out research projects um, under the mentorship of a technical manager from NSA or the National Labs. And the projects do include uh, among other things, protocol analysis. We also um, uh, have funds to issue more SFS scholarships to qualified students. 
And if you're interested, please contact me. So our last call for a question. So if not, we'll see you in two weeks. And thank you very much, Ed, for giving a, a very interesting talk. All right, well, thank you.